Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our Sunday morning service. This is called our COVID-friendly uh, morning service. As uh, many of you know, those of you watching live stream, um, our county was shut down to baseline, but uh, there's a way, and God uh, showed us a way that we could do everything and meet everybody's expectations, and yet still be able to have God's people meet. So we've gone to multiple services, and if you didn't, if you look for the early service and you didn't see it, it's because we don't broadcast the early service. I don't want to, you to see anybody sleeping, and uh, and I also don't want you to hear. You're going to be singing a song here, and you got to hit that high note. I'm not going to do that on early service because you don't want to hear them try to hit the high note. And, uh, but anyway, we had a wonderful time this morning. We're going to have a wonderful time again with you today. So find your songbooks and stand. Brother Carl's going to tell you where we're headed here. Okay, number 281, Jesus Saved. Amen. Let's all stand, please. Again. Oh, we have heard the joyful sound. song of the service. Uh, first of all, let me give a couple welcomes here. Cindy from South Carolina. I am so glad to meet you. Um, you, you, barely meet the, you barely meet the Person Times Mile Award. You barely get that one. Uh, you have another man who is trying there from Oklahoma, and that is Chuck from Oklahoma. Uh, pass, pass him through, and Chuck, I'm glad that you found us. Uh, especially during this most unusual time, it's good to have visitors. Uh, we had uh, two children in our in our children's ministries today that we hadn't seen for a long time, as well. And um, and it's hard to believe Sunday school promotion Sunday is next Sunday, and and I don't understand it because I haven't aged a bit, and I wonder how these children get older. I just don't understand uh, how that happens. And so we're going to have a word of prayer, ask God's blessing on the service on this wonderful day. After that, uh, we have a socially distanced ladies ensemble that's going to sing for us. So let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, as, uh, as we begin this service, uh, we want to tell you that we love you. And uh, when we look at all the problems that exist in our society, uh, we know you're not to blame. Uh, we know that uh, man uh, owns title and deed uh, for so much of this, uh, his actions and his reactions, and yet you are still a good and loving and merciful God 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I think of all the things that we personally have put you through, and yet you love us still. We are so grateful for that. So we pray that we would see your blessing upon this service. We would see the moving of your Holy Spirit and that you would help us in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated and the ladies are going to sing. Let's turn to number uh, 248, My Anchor Holds, and it's good to have that anchor in Christ, and uh, we'll uh, sing this out.
And the cable, though unseen, bears the heavy strain between. Whose arm I can leave till the turning of the tide, and it holds my anchor. back to number 185 185 our rock of ages amen a rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee let the wall Riverside which flowed be of sin a double cure save me from its guilt and power not the labors of my hands can fulfill thy laws demands could my zeal no rest my dough could my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone nothing in my hand I bring simply to thy cross I cling make it come to me for grace helpless love Watch me mayor or I die while I draw this bleeding bread with mine eyes shall glow to death when I soar to worlds unknown see the on thy judgment throne rock of ages left let me hide myself in thee. Amen. Amen. Wonderful singing at this time. Is there anybody and you need a bulletin of the month? Again, this is the bulletin of the month. Uh, yellow is the color of August. Just thought I'd let you know that. If anybody need one, looks like everybody has one. And we will go through this uh, really quickly. Uh, by the way, sometimes it's important to know the deeper truths. Are you, are you deeper truthers? Uh, so here's the deep truth. This comes from our Sunday school class. Uh, one of the children who read their take-home papers. And I discovered today that a volcano is a mountain with the hiccups. And so uh, that is one of your deep truths for the day. And so I thought I would give you that. And uh, you can publish it from the rooftops or you can tell people that Jesus saves. That works as well. 
And so uh, to our congregation, um, let me encourage you, uh, because uh, with the shutdown, some of our outreaches are curtailed. Uh, but you will see there we do have a track rack. And in there we have our church flyers. In there we also have God's Bridge to Eternal Life. And let me encourage you uh, to still take those with you. And when you do your essential shopping trip at your essential grocery store, uh, you can take that church track and give your, uh, your cashier the essentials. And, uh, you know, um, you know, the often as they say, um, you know, the Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. And uh, just the important to get the gospel out because people right now need hope. Uh, a family in our church, they came to me. They said we were taking our morning walk and we saw an elderly couple uh, walking through the park by themselves in the great outdoors nobody around them with their masks on. And that tells you, that tells you the huge fear, the huge fear that exists. I mean, uh, the, you and I know we have a doctor in the house and he goes, okay, the COVID virus can go about this far and then it, you know, eventually it, you know, it evaporates due to lack of moisture and things like that. And we live in a desert. Uh, but there are people in great fear and they believe this COVID virus, you know, that every single COVID virus has a, a big red S on it, can leap tall buildings at a single bound, uh, can travel for miles and miles unabated, and none of, it, none of it is true. There is so much fear and misinformation. And the reality is, and this is maybe the most important thing to understand, God is the author of life and death, not man. And God actually makes the choice. Now, I say let's be sensible, you know, Let's not do anything foolish and uh, do anything foolish to get infected or do anything foolish to infect somebody else. But God hath not given us the spirit of fear. And, and we need to understand this. And uh, I, I basically walk around fearless. And the reason I walk around fearless is because I'm on my way to heaven. You know, you know what, can, what bad could happen? Oh, I could die. Uh, to which I guess my answer would be, yay. You know, you know, I actually live my life believing heaven is better. I don't believe that heaven is a, a cheap consolation pli prize for religious people. No, heaven is the better place. And so I look forward to that. So talking, let me go through just some of our announcements here. Uh, to our congregation, most everything you have in the bulletin, most things are still on schedule. Uh, because we fit all the, all the requirements. We're either outdoors or we're less than 25. Uh, we have the ability, uh, you know, to do our social distancing thing. And so almost everything is still functional. Again, if you're in Faith Bible Institute, that'll be starting on the 20th of August. Please let me know whether or not you're attending Institute on campus, which we can do, or if for some reason you're electing uh, to go off campus, you have that option as well. Also, it just so happens that on Tuesday night, it is the peak of the Percy meter shower. And so outside, there are going to be plenty of falling stars that night. There is no moon, so it should be wonderful. And so if, um, if it just so happens that, that some uh, un unmentioned people happen to show up at an unmentioned farm, uh, with their lawn chairs and their own snacks and just happen to sit in the same general location, you know what, it's going to be okay. And so anyway, uh, so, so look at your schedule on Tuesday. It kind of gives a time on that. Again, next Sunday, uh, a parents of Sunday school children, Sunday school promotion is next Sunday, and we do have several uh, that are promoting from one class uh, to another. So, so letting you know um, that that is taking place and uh, you can read about some other things that are taking place. To those of you who have expressed an interest in an education alternative, as you know, here in the state of Oregon, most schools are going to be doing distance learning. Uh, some of you may interpret that as no learning, and you may be partially correct on that. And so some of you have responded to us and we're in the process of forming uh, the Berean Baptist Academy Homeschool Association. 
And so if you are a parent, that, by the way, that is for, um, that is for uh, church member parents. And if you have an interest in your child, I want you to sign the interest sheet, which is in the foyer, and sign that. Uh, sign the name of your child, what grade they'll be going into. And we will have um, a more thorough orientation meeting uh, Saturday, uh, this coming Saturday at 10 a.m. And so I want you to know about that. We are working very, very hard on this. And uh, we're playing a little bit of catch up as everybody is uh, when all of a sudden they wake up and they tell them there's no school. They don't always give you a lot of notice about that. So uh, anyway, just letting you know that is going on. Um, I am going to have Brother Carl, uh, before, um, before you lead this next song, um, I, I want you um, to, to pray for somebody and uh, that person is Joyce Cooley. Uh, Joyce Cooley is the wife of the founding pastor of Berean Baptist Church. Our church was founded 40 years ago. And uh, Joyce, uh, Joyce Cooley presently is hospitalized due to having had gallbladder surgery. And so, Brother Carl, if we could pray for her. Uh, what a wonderful lady. Many of you had a chance to meet her again five years ago. Of course, uh, last year her husband went to heaven. And, but we just need to remember her in prayer. And so, uh, Brother Carl, um, if you could pray for her and then lead in the next song. Go ahead. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the founding of Berean Baptist Church. And Lord, uh, we just uh, pray for this founding uh, man's wife, uh, Joyce, that you would uh, help her in this time to recover. And Lord, that it would be a smooth recovery, that there be no infections, no problems uh, at all. And Lord, that you are in charge, we know. And and we just ask that you would uh, bless her and help her uh, to have a, a, a good recovery in all this. And we love you, Lord, and thank you and look to you for all things. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's uh, turn to number 222. 222, everybody standing, please. 222, <clears throat> sing the mighty power of God. singing please remain standing and uh, please uh, find your Bibles 
and uh, turn in the Word of God to the book of First Chronicles, book of First Chronicles, and um, the way you can always uh, tell, okay, Chronicles is Old Testament, uh, Corinthians is the New Testament, and so First Chronicles, we're going to be looking in chapter 21, chapter 21 this uh, morning, uh, we've been <coughs> singing uh, about God's uh, mighty power, about who God is. And it's very important for you to understand that the way you live your life as a born-again believer is, is connected uh, to what you believe about Almighty God. And if what you believe about Almighty God is absolutely correct, it will take you in a certain direction. If what you believe about Almighty God is incorrect, it's going to take you in a different direction. And I have a saying about that. It's called right doctrine, right direction, right destination. Wrong doctrine, wrong direction, wrong destination. And so it's important that our direction is right and it's important <coughs> that we understand God's will in a very important way. First Chronicles uh, chapter 21 verses 1 through 4 and we're going to be uh, looking here <coughs> at a battle of wills here starting in verse 1 and we have this statement here and Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now I'm going to stop and I'm going to give a little bit of explanation with each verse. We have here, we have King David, the man after God's own heart, the man who wrote so many of the Psalms in Scripture, uh, the man who sought God and sought God's will, the man who knew what it was to have both sin and repentance and restoration, the man who was a mighty warrior for Almighty God, the man who beat Goliath, the man had a great idea. And it was the devil's idea. It was not God's idea. And since Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel, and David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. So one, we look at King David and we're looking at him in such an unusual light because he was undoubtedly throughout scriptural history a man approved of God. And now we're looking at Joab. And Joab, if you follow his life, was not really approved by God at all, uh, Joab, the four-star general, the originally original Italian Don. The original man said, you're part of my family, but you disappoint me. You know, and it would always uh, take care of his competition by murdering his competition and knocking him off. And we have Joab who says, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are not thy all thy, my Lord's servants? Why de then doth my Lord require this thing? Thy will, why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? So you have Joab, the general, and he got it right this way. He knew that for David to number the people of Israel was a sin against the Old Testament law and a sin against God. And so he's saying, we really shouldn't do this. Next phrase. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab. Wherefore, Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, as we now look into your word, we look into its reality. We look into its authority. And we now search your word for you, our God, your character, your purpose, and your will. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we have here the reality here in Scripture. 
And that between King David and between Joab, there was a battle of the wills. And here's something that I've discovered, and that is when there is a battle of the wills, somebody's will is going to prevail. How many here in the congregation this morning, uh, you have been parents? Okay, you have been parents, okay? You may put your hands down. How many of you, having been parents, discovered that your children had a will? How does it? Wow, look at all those hands up. No exceptions. What an amazing thing. And I often say that parenting is a contest between who is going to train who. Is the parent going to train the child or is the child going to train the parent? It is a contest. And my observation is sometimes the parent wins and sometimes they don't. And so it is very interesting to notice this. So we see here Joab had a will. And David had a will, and David's will prevailed over Joab, but David's will got him in trouble. He had a great idea. It was not God's idea. In fact, we can see plainly in Scripture, it actually was Satan's idea. But nobody could talk David out of his idea or David out of his will. And the consequences were great. 70,000 citizens of Israel perished because of David's strong will. Now, that doesn't mean the will is a bad thing. Let me stop and, and say this. The Bible says, and God created man in his own image. Not the Mormon image of nose and ears and fingers and toes, but the Bible image of that we have been created in God's image. And because of this, we have some of God's attributes. We are created a body and a soul and a spirit. And with that creation also, God created in us cognition, which means we have the ability to think. God created within us creativity, <clears throat> that we have the ability to be creative, and we have the ability to set a direction, and we have an ability to plan. And in that, those attributes of God, God also created man with a will. And we believe that man has that will. We don't believe that God created a will within man and then in unfortunate wrong doctrine, the doctrine of Calvinism or hyper-Calvinism as you would say, then said, okay, I created you a will and now I will not let you use it. My sovereignty will superimpose your will. Well, that doesn't even make rational sense. God created man with a will so that man would exercise his will. But God is hoping that in the exercise of man's will, that man will understand some things about the will of God. And it is no surprise that sometimes man's will and God's will are in conflict. Here's one reason why. Man does not trust God's goodness. And man often does not trust God's will. And that brings me to the message this morning. This message is entitled, The Importance of God's Will. Because how you perceive God will direct your entire life and what you understand about God's will will set your direction for blessing or for cursing, for good or for evil, for a life of significance or a life of waste. And it is important for us to be able to discern between the two. So there are five points this morning. Uh, one for each finger. Okay, you'll have to write a little smaller on the thumb and the pinky. Okay, but we have five points this morning. So let us start by looking at this. And we have to understand God's will and the act of God's will. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 1, 
looking at verses 1 and 2. And the Bible says this. God who at sundry times, and this means at various times and appointed times, and in diverse manners, this means in many different ways, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, Hast, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, but look at this last phrase, by whom also he made the worlds. So I want you to understand something. God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And it, we have here the worlds and the world and the universe were formed by the word of God. But before there was the word of God, there was the will of God. And understand that usually before you speak your words, you have your will. You have an intent, you have a direction, you have an opinion, and you plan to say it. Some of you don't plan very well. And uh, somebody once had an old poem. It said, shifting, speeding words go by, brain in neutral, tongue in high. And um, sometimes we have this reality that we, we move a little too quickly on that. But I want you to understand that the word of God came because of the will of God. And it was in the will of God that he would create the known universe, as you see, and the stars. And by the way, Comet Swift Tuttle, of which we are now passing through the trail of that comet's orbit, so that on Tuesday night, you can look at these little chunks of rock spinning through our Earth's atmosphere, and you'll go, ooh, and ah, God created that, and he created it for you, by the way. You'll say, well, he created it for his glory. Yes, but he also created it for your entertainment. You get to see it. Because not only did God create the heavens and the earth, but God created man in his own image. God made a decision to create you. And God made a decision to create me. And it's not simply by chance. It's not simply randomness it's not just simply because there was a male and there is a female and at this point I divert just a little bit and I said have you noticed that two males cannot reproduce and have you noticed two females cannot reproduce and so God created the male and female on purpose so they can populate the earth that's the only law of nature that works correctly everything else is unnatural and is against the institution of how God created things so God created, uh, God created a male, of which I'm glad, and God created female, of which I'm glad, and God created you, not by accident, never by accident, but on purpose, and because God deliberately created you on purpose, you need to stop and ask why you need to ask why why did God create me not why did God create man why did God create me it's an important question that must be asked and it deserves the dignity of an answer so first of all to understand God's will by God's will all creation came into existence and you and I are an act of God's will that's number one but number two there is another thing that we have by the act of God's will turn with me to second Peter the book of second Peter chapter one and I think of all the things that God could have done and then I think of what God did it do and it's important to understand that because we serve a perfect almighty God and he doesn't make mistakes it's important to know what he did do look with me at second Peter chapter 1 look at verse 19 we have also a more sure word of prophecy whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts knowing this first 
that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Stop and look at that again. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. Stop. Let us look at that again. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is our second point. By God's will, we have God's word. And God made a conscious decision to bring his word down to man whom he created. And it's important to understand this. The God's word was not written after a night of bad pizza. God's word was written by the will of God, the Holy Spirit of God, superimposing his will upon men to see that God's word would be written. And by the way, God was not making it up as he went. And God was not waiting for man to do what he would do before he wrote it because he already knew what man would do. And because of that, we have this reality of why when the angel appeared unto Daniel, he said, I am here to tell you what is written in the scripture of truth. There is already scripture in heaven, as the Bible says, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. There already was a master copy in heaven before it ever got down to earth. It was, a, it was an act of the will of God that you would know the word of God so that you would know the character of God because you cannot know the character of God without knowing his word. And we have literally the spiritual corpses of countless masses and generations because they refused to acknowledge the word of God and they made it up as they went flying by the seat of their pants, never finding out who God is or who God was. And I sadly say this, some born-again believers included who have received the gospel but have not received the overarching complete truth of the Word of God. Anything there is to be known about God is found in the Word of God and the Word of God actually instructs us how to know God. I think that's a pretty thing and to understand something number one you have to say God created me and you must ask the question why and then number two say God sent me his word so I would know him so again you need to ask the question why why did God send me his word and you come to a very interesting thing when you have communication, you have a relationship. You do not have a pantheist God that has force but no conscience and everything runs like a river and you're just a drop in one big ocean. Boy, that makes you feel significant. Or you have the Muslim God who knows you existed, knows he created you and doesn't care by the way, that's why they go nuts. That's why they do penance. That's why they beat themselves with chains. That's why they cut themselves. That's why they blow themselves up with bombs because they're trying to get God's attention because in their view of God, they never can get his attention. My word says right now, you have God's undivided attention. So it's important to know that. By God's will... We have God's word and man sometimes resists and there's a battle over wills. But when man resists the word of God, God's word prevails. The Bible says this in Isaiah 55. It says this, it says that, um, that my word shall not return unto me void. It says it will accomplish the purpose for which I sent it. So God's word has purpose and it will accomplish his will. But there's been a couple people who tried to kind of stop it. One of them's name is Jonah. Anybody hear of Jonah? Yeah. Anybody want to be Jonah? Nobody wants to be Jonah? Listen, Jonah had a... I can sum up um, part of the life of Jonah really, really easy. The weather started getting rough. The tiny ship was tossed. 
It's pretty easy to sum up part of the life of Jonah. And this is what happened in Jonah chapter 1, 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah had the responsibility of putting forth the word of God to that city because God wanted that city to know his word. Jonah didn't want to do it. And so Jonah took a boat, went the other way. How did that work out? Okay, he learned what seasickness was. He learned how well he could not swim. He learned what it was to be fish food. And he learned what it was to be part of vomit. None of that sounds like a good prospect for ministry. And it's because Jonah said no. Okay, lesson learned, probably not a good idea to say no to God when it comes to the word of God. Jonah chapter 3, looking at verse 1, And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. And Jonah went, Okay, yes sir, I'm on my way. Now, how soon do you want me there? I'll jog if you want me to. He learned. Understand, man sometimes resists, but God's word prevails. How about Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a preacher, and nobody liked his preaching. And they gave him grief. Jeremiah chapter 20. And they gave Jeremiah just huge amounts of grief for preaching his word. And they got mad at him, and they imprisoned him, and they tortured him. And, um, you know, uh, Jeremiah would be the preacher that would get nasty notes under his door, uh, uh, text messages from unknown numbers, you know, that type of thing. This was kind of the life of Jonah. And Jonah says, I am tired of it. I know I'm a preacher of the word. I quit. Which probably lasted all of 10 minutes. Jeremiah 20, verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out, I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me and a derision daily. He dreaded getting up to preach God's word. He dreaded getting pelted by tomatoes. He, he dreaded the whole thing. He says, I'm not going to do it anymore. Then I said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones and I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay and good thing because we can see what happens when the word of God that is supposed to come out doesn't come out anybody think of way too much uh, way too much ammonium nitrate in a storage facility in Beirut Lebanon it's better to do it God's way and let the word of God come out so we have two things here number one we have the will of God by God's will all creation came into existence including you and me you need to ask why number two by God's will we have God's word you need to ask why and we now need this is important we need to understand God's will because when you understand the will of God, it may change the course of your entire life. Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Book of 2 Peter, looking at chapter 3 and looking at verse 9 to understand something of the will of God. And it says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. Now, the term slack means it's the idea that you make a promise and you just don't get around to keeping it. You're slack on it. You know, I promise I'll pick you up at 11. I pick you up at 11.15, okay? I promise that I will meet you on Monday. I meet you on Tuesday. That is a slack promise. And it's a, important to understand God is not slack 
concerning his promise. In fact, the Bible says this, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So first of all, dealing with God's will, this is point number three, but dealing with the character of God's will. Number one, God's will is merciful. God's will is merciful. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness that we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. But God commendeth his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. First thing about God's will, understand that God's will is merciful. And that it says that God is long-suffering. It means that he puts up with us to the nth degree. Again, parents, have you noticed that even though your children had wills, that not all your children were the same? Some children, you could tell them something to do, they might do it the first time. Some might do it the second time. Some might do it the 200,579th time. All children require a certain degree of long-suffering. Some require more than others. And God looked at mankind and mankind's evil. God looks at all the protests going on in Portland. And he looks at everything they prote protest. By the way, they've protested every single institution of God. They've protested God's institution of marriage. They've protested the word of God. Last weekend they were burning Bibles at the protest. So they protest God, they protest his institutions, they protest God's word, they protest God's worship, and they protest God's institution of government. They have protested all three, and God goes, well, it's about time. I've sure been waiting to wipe those people out. Long suffering toward us word and them word. And you go, boy, I'm sure glad God loves us. I don't, I'm sure he doesn't love them. That's not true. He does. And he will love them till the day they die. Not willing that they should perish. He wants to see them. God's will and God's mercy is that they would turn around and they would see God who he really is and they would embrace the great love of the Savior that died for them. We all come from different walks of life. Some of us were saved as children and being saved as children, you have your deep sin list of all the deep, horrifyingly terrible sins you committed before you were five. But some of us were saved later and we have a much longer, deeper list and we may even ask, how could God forgive me of that? But understand the will of God is mercy and he has mercy and he wants to see those that are in rebellion against him turn. That's the character of God's will. And what's so amazing is how the will of God prevails in the dilemma of man when man realizes he has a dilemma. Turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Book of Mark chapter 1, two reasons. Uh, one, the book of Mark is the favorite name that I have in the Bible. And um, the other one is it's easy to, always easy to find a chapter 1. Uh, Mark chapter 1, looking at verse 40. Looking to 42. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. By the way, um, uh, being a leper, it's a horrible disease. What happened is the nerve endings die. The nerve endings die first at the end of the extremities. Um, leprosy, of course, long term can be terminal. And so they die. You can hit your fingers. You can injure your fingers, not know it. The ends begin to rot off. Uh, the ends of the extremities begin to rot off. It's a terrible disease. And this man, who probably by this time looked terrible, prevailed upon 
the merciful will of God and said this to Jesus. It said, if thou wilt. It says, if you have the will, you can heal me. Thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I do have the will. He says, God, if you have the will, and he touched him and said, I do have the will. He says, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him and he was cleansed. And it's important for us to understand, when you're thinking about the will of God and can I trust God's will, Understand that God's will is merciful and what comes to his children, you would be amazed what God is willing to do if you would just ask him. But there's another characteristic of God's will. Turn with me to Romans chapter 12. The book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, and looking in verse 2, a common verse, some of you go, uh, Pastor, you, you already preached on this verse not that long ago. Actually, I preached on Romans 12, 1. But look at Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that ye may prove, that is, put to the test and see if it gets a passing or failing grade. Put it to the test. Prove what is that good and acceptable, catch this word, and perfect will of God. And this is the second point of God's will. Understand its character. Understand God's will is perfect. It is not good. It is not better than some. <clears throat> it does not pass majority vote. God's will is perfect. And what it means perfect is there is no evil motive. There is no sin in it. There is no flaw in it. It is perfect. <coughs> to help you understand, Jesus, God's Son, God incarnate, God in the flesh, lived a perfect life on planet Earth. What that means is is there is nothing that Jesus ever said recording in Scripture where Jesus went, oops, I misspoke. There is no place that Jesus went while he was on planet Earth and went, oops, I didn't mean to go here. Jesus' life on planet Earth was perfect. Everything he said, he said by his will and he said on purpose. Every person he healed, he healed by his will and he healed on purpose. And when he went to the cross, he went on purpose. It was an act of his will. Understand, God's will is perfect. There's no flaw in God's will of any kind. And God's will, by the way, prevails sometimes when our will and God's will conflicts. Look with me at Acts chapter 16. The book of Acts chapter 16, looking at the clock right there, I'm here to give you great confidence. We will finish this message today. I wanted you to know that. Acts chapter 16, looking at verse 6. Now when they had gone throughout Perga in the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. What is that? That's God enacting his perfect will. And so you have the Apostle Paul, and he wants to go to Asia. And Paul has good intention. Paul has good desire. Paul wants to see people saved. And he takes a step to go to Asia, and the Holy Spirit goes, eh! You're not going there. And the will of God, God's perfect will, prevailed. And so, steered Paul in another direction. And as you look at God's word here, he then says, this, After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. Means he did not allow them, tried to go this direction. Again, God's perfect will prevailed. And so, Paul was being steered to go in what? 
in God's mind, if it's in God's mind, then that's all you need to know, a perfect direction. And it says here, And they passing by Mysia came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night, and there stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel to them. Let me ask you this question. Why would you want to live your life on the edge of God's will? Why would you want to live your life when God has a perfect will? Why would you want to live on the edges, on the periphery, getting the crumbs of God's blessing when instead you could be in God's perfect will and get the full brunt of the blessings of Almighty God? By the way, that's what happened to the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul wound up going to Philippi and it was a great time. You know, he, he, um, you know, he went down to the river and he, he met some people who would become the nucleus of the church in Philippi. And then he had a great time. Cast out a demon, got beat up. Silas got beat up. They got thrown in stocks. They got thrown in prison. Singing prayers, late at, <coughs> singing and praising God late at night. Great earthquake. Philippian jailer wanted to kill himself. No, don't do that. We're all here. What must I do to be saved? You know the rest of the story. He got saved. They baptized him in the middle of the night. I have never done a 2 a.m. baptism. It just never has come up. I'll tell you, I do any baptism at any time anybody want me to right now. And so 2 a.m. baptism, it was God's perfect will for God's perfect church. Some of you have been involved at some time in your life in starting a church. It's not easy. And I've discovered just watching, sometimes they take and sometimes they don't. There's a man who tried to start a church in Polson, Montana. He lasted about nine months and then that was it. Evaporated, wasn't able to get anybody to come because uh, he had a will. Is a good will, a good idea? Wasn't God's perfect will. But when God has a perfect will, do you realize that Paul started the church of Philippi, then had to get out of town, and that church went and became the number one missions-minded church of its day because of God's perfect will. God's will prevailed to the perfect direction. And we also have, and I'll just simply read this, God's word prevailed to the perfect solution. And you may ask why this is in here. Why did God have a discussion with God in Luke chapter 22? Why did they have a conversation? Why did they have a discussion? I am so glad you asked that question because I'm about to answer it. Luke chapter 22 and look with me at verse 41. Luke 22 verse 41 and this is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And you go, why did God the Father and God the Son even have this conversation? No, Jesus is articulating, I really do not want to go through the crucifixion process. That really seems absolutely, truly unpleasant to me. And yet he says, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Was God the Son ever going to do anything different than the word of God? And the answer is, of course not. It wasn't written for him, it was written for you. Because remember what I told you. Everything that Jesus did was a perfect life. He never went anywhere that he wasn't supposed to go. He never said anything that he wasn't supposed to say. He never healed anybody that he wasn't supposed to do. He never did a sign that he wasn't supposed to do. Everything that he did was to teach you and to teach me. And Jesus is the example of the Christian life. And the example is this. When you come in conflict between your will and God's will, if you want to do the sensible thing, if you want to do the helpful thing, if you want to do the perfect thing, then say, not my will, but thine be done. 
how important it is to understand that God's, the Father's will prevailed for a perfect solution and the perfect solution results in you being able to be in this church right now, Lord willing, as a born-again believer because of God's will. Because of God's merciful will and because of God's perfect will. And then for you and me, the final point, it is God's practical will. Look with me at Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Jeremiah 29, looking at verse 11, was simply says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And it tells you a couple things really quick about God's practical will. One, it tells you this. You're on God's mind. You're on God's mind right now. And then it also tells you this. God says, you're on my mind, and I have a plan. And my plan is practical, and my plan has a planned outcome and my plan is a good plan we can see king david he had plans and most of the time king david's plans were good plans and they're blessed by god but it was not blessed by god in that one documented battle of the wills where his will went against joab's will and went against god's will and there was catastrophe because of it. It's important to understand how practical God's will is for you. And it is amazing to me how many people will not trust God. They will not trust his merciful will. They will not trust his perfect will. And they will not trust its practical will. The Apostle Paul was living testimony of both sides of the coin of the will of God. And let's, in closing, let's look at Paul's life real quickly here. Turn with me to Acts chapter 9. Book of Acts chapter 9. And you have the Apostle Paul then called Saul. And remember, Saul was created in the image of God, just like you were, just like I am. He's created a body, soul, and spirit. He's created with cognition. He's created with thinking. He's created with planning. And he says, I have a great idea. I am going to kill Christians for a living. That was his plan. And if you look here, it says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters that if he, be found, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. The apostle Paul, or at that time with Saul, was on collision course, and the will of Saul and the will of God collided on that Damascus road. And Saul was confronted with the fact that he was not the only one with a will. And he fell to the earth and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? By the way, in the Greek that means, Okay, uncle, I give up. You're in charge. And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he's saying, why in the world are you beating your head against the wall trying to do your will? And then Paul said some of the most important words that he could say. And he trembling and astonished said, and this is technically what he said. He said, Lord, what? is your will for my life he said lord what wilt thou have me to do paul's will came in direct collision and conflict with god's will to where paul had to make a decision 
and his decision was to follow God's will. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Understand this. Paul could have continued with his will. It would have laid waste to his entire earthly life. Then it would have resulted in hell, which is even worse. Paul, looking back on his life, had this to say in Philippians chapter 3. And in verse 7, the Apostle Paul said this, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And the Apostle Paul, looking back on his life, and looking back on his old will, will says, what I was going to do, my plans, my pedigree, everything, I now look back on that, and I said, my will was a pile of manure compared to the perfect will of God. How did Paul's life end? His life ended grateful. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, meaning from this time forward, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing directly applied a person who in the conflict of wills puts their will aside instead trusts God's merciful will and perfect will and practical will their lives the late Beverly Leturco who is now in heaven the wife of the previous pastor of this church she had a favorite phrase and that favorite phrase was God is too wise to be mistaken God is too good to be unkind and how important it is as we enact the freedom of what God has put in us created in our image and that is the freedom of will how important it is that our will becomes conformed to God's merciful and perfect and practical will because that can change the entire direction and outcome of a person's life. Let us have a word of prayer. <clears throat> in a moment, we are going to lead in a song. Uh, we will have an invitation. An invitation is an opportunity to make a decision. And whether you're in this sanctuary or whether you're watching from the outside, you may be at a point of decision right now. I am here to tell you by the authority of God's word that God's will is better. I'm here to tell you from a person who has had his own battle of wills with God. I'm here to tell you that God's will is better. But he will not take your will from you. That is something you have to surrender on your own. Dear Heavenly Father, please use your word this morning as only you can. You are a good God. You love your creation. You have proven your love for us. Help us to trust your good, merciful, and perfect and practical will. 
in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. The song is 153. 153, all to Jesus I surrender. And we'll sing a few verses of this song. If you have a need in your heart or your spirit, something you want to bring before the Lord, uh, the altar is open as we sing this song. All to Jesus I surrender. All to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. I surrender. Thank you.